I just want to welcome everyone to the eighth annual Renee Royak Shaler Lecture in Health Equity. I'm Dr. Landetta Jones, and I am the Deputy Director of our program in Health Equity and Population Health here at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Our program in Health Equity and Population Health is situated in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health, though we welcome members from any discipline uh, from across our campus and in the community as well. Please check the chat for a link to our website where you can join the mailing list in order to receive information and updates from us. So before we begin, just a few housekeeping rules to make note of. This lecture will be recorded and we will make the recording available on our website following this event. I ask everyone to please leave your videos off and remember to mute your microphones throughout the lecture. We welcome you to use the chat to send questions or comments, or if you need assistance. As I mentioned, we're recording this lecture. And so for those who are taking this for CNE attendance, um, we'll put the link to the sign-in sheet in the chat as well. So please click the link and enter your name and email address to receive credit for attending. If you would like to receive CMEs, please remain signed in for the entire lecture. If you need to receive CMEs and didn't register or don't remember if you selected them, please contact Cassie Santoni. We will also put her email in the chat as well. So at the conclusion of the lecture, we will invite you to turn on your videos and microphones and we'll have a virtual networking opportunity with Dr. Olapade. And we'll conclude this at 5.30 p.m. So we all encourage you to join us uh, and stay after the presentation for that. So thank you so much for your attention to these details. Now, I would like to introduce the Vice Chair of Academic Programs for the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health and the Director of the MPH Program, Dr. Diane Marie St. George. Good afternoon and thank you for the introduction, Dr. Jones. I'd like to first off thank all of our attendees for joining us for this annual event. We look forward to the future, of course, when we will once again be able to gather in person and enjoy all the networking and camaraderie this event has afforded us in the past. I'm honored to be a part of this lecture series, which was endowed in dedication to my predecessor as MPH Program Director, Dr. Renee Royak Shaler. She was a dedicated teacher, academic leader, and researcher who was committed to cancer prevention among African Americans and devoted her career to the elimination of disparities across the continuum of cancer care. I would like to thank the members of Dr. Royak Shaler's family, whose generosity has ensured that our that her passion for these issues lives on through this annual lecture series. Each year, we are able to bring one of the best scholars and policymakers in the country to the University of Maryland School of Medicine to present their work on pressing issues in health disparities and health equity to ensure that visibility continues to be brought to these topics that were so important to Dr. Royak Shaler. I'm very excited to hear from our speaker this year as she is a pre preeminent scholar in this work and her accomplishments and work embody the spirit of this memorial lecture in honor of Dr. Royak Shaler. And here to introduce our speaker to you is the chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health here at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Dr. Jay Magaziner. Thank you, Diane Marie, and thank you, Londetta. Um, I'm also enthusiastic about today's speaker, not only for the reasons mentioned already, but because Dr. Olapare is a faculty member at my alma mater, the University of Chicago. I'm so pleased we were able to be here virtually and continue one of our most popular and well-attended events of recent years, one where we're able to have speakers of such impressive caliber to inspire us to continue our work in health equity. Um, Dr. Olapati is, is the Walter L. Palmer Distinguished Service Professor of Medicine 
and the founding director of the Center for Clinician Cancer Genetics and Global Health at the University of Chicago Medicine. Her research is focused on gaining a better understanding of the root causes of genomic of the causes and genomic basis of cancer in diverse populations. She's published extensively on genetic and non-genetic risk factors for breast cancer and is internationally renowned for her work in inherited cancer syndromes and her clinical expertise in early detection and prevention of breast cancer in high-risk women. Dr. Alapati mapped genes frequently altered in cancer and has characterized the molecular pathways defining aggressive forms of breast cancer in women of African descent. Dr. Olapade received numerous honors and awards, including a MacArthur Fellowship for translating findings on the molecular genetics of breast cancer in African and African-American women into innovative clinical practices in the United States and abroad. And we just learned that tomorrow she will be inducted into the National Academy of Sciences and Medicine, which is truly a great honor for anyone entering that academy. Her talk today is entitled Population Risk Stratification to Improve Breast Cancer Outcomes and promises to be stimulating and to provoke much further discussion during the networking time, which I hope you will all stay for and forward some questions as they arise during the talk for discussion after the talk. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Funme Olopade. Dr. Olopade. Thank you so much for the um, really wonderful uh, introduction and for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's really, uh, really a great honor to be able to uh, give a distinguished lectureship in memory of such a wonderful uh, person like Dr. Royal Scheller. And I also want to join my colleagues in um, thanking the family uh, for maintaining uh, her legacy. Um, because it's really the case that, you know, for those who uh, carry on a legacy of a loved one, then, you know, they didn't die because they did their part. And now those of us who are alive have to carry on the legacy. And uh, I, I really, uh, in reading up about her and looking at how she really was so passionate about health disparities, I, I am so delighted that this goes on. And so I, I come as a, a professor at the University of Chicago, and I know that um, when I was thinking about uh, all my schedule and the things I had to juggle this week, I was so happy that I could do this uh, remotely and, uh, and be able to, um, to share uh, my, uh, my ideas around population risk stratification for prevention and early detection of breast cancer. And uh, I truly must also thank everyone who's worked hard to make this possible, uh, members of the selection committee, and uh, everyone has been so helpful in uh, helping me manage my, uh, my time. So let me start without much further ado. Uh, I do, because this is a medical uh, uh, audience, I do have financial disclosures, but I will not discuss off-label use uh, of investigational agents. And uh, what I want to do is really share my journey at the University of Chicago and, um, and Dr. Magazine, and you will know that Chicago today and on some days when the sun comes up and it's nice and it's bright, you say, you know what, you're a Chicago and you're not ever going to leave Chicago. Uh, but when it's cold and windy, then you say, why are you in Chicago? But I'm in Chicago because I truly love the city, and uh, and I've it's I've done incredibly well by living in a diverse city, a city where we have neighborhoods. And so when I started my 
Cancer Risk Clinic in 1992, um, you know, my, my boss and program leader, and that's one thing that I think Jay would say is that we do really do a lot of mentoring and we care about our students. And so we tend to uh, really um, uh, make sure that uh, we, we think outside the box. So I'm always thinking outside the box. So at that time I was like, well, genetics is, yeah, I might as well be a soothsayer. And there's so many of them on 53rd street as I'm walking to work. So how am I supposed to predict people's risk for breast cancer when we didn't even have any genes that we could test for? And yet we were mapping genes and we knew that in fact, by having brave families to come forward that we can uh, be able to think about predicting, preempting and preventing cancer. And what was important to me was that we had uh, to think about heterogeneity of population and geography, uh, even within a city like Chicago, you will hear about disparities that people who, uh, those of uh, 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 my neighbors who live on the south side of Chicago, that there's a 12 year disparity in life expectancy within the same country uh, compared to and the same city. And so it's a complex problem thinking about uh, uh, health disparities. So I've really been thinking about are people dying prematurely uh, because we link advancing age with risk of cancer, do not have appropriate tools for risk assessment and have not trained the workforce to accelerate progress in cancer control and prevention. And since I'm in a uh, department of public health, I can tell you that I started off as a medical oncologist. I trained as a card carrying oncologist but when I was in medical school in Nigeria, we were told to think about preventive and social medicine. And after almost 40 years training and practicing in America, I still think that preventive and social medicine is the way to go. And we've learned certainly from this uh, pandemic that that's really what we have to do. And why is that the case? Uh, we have a huge uh, cancer burden in the US. And it was uh, really almost uh, uh, more than uh, um, 50 years ago that President Nixon declared war on cancer. And that's why we have the National Cancer Institute. And you can see once that war was declared, we started figuring out how to screen, what to do. And then of course, we started uh, really thinking about uh, 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 training more interdisciplinary uh, oncologists because before then, surgery was the only thing we did uh, that was mostly curable for cancer. So we did more and more surgery. But then surgeons also started doing clinical research and we made progress. So as we um, diagnosed more cancers, we actually saw both uh, sexes that we were able to cure more individuals with cancer. And so this was a flat line for many years uh, in terms of death rates. But as we began to have really effective therapies, you can see both for men and uh, women. But this uh, death rate for men actually happened because men stopped smoking and women picked up tobacco. And we will talk about that later. So that now to, uh, lung cancer is the number one cause of death for women in the US. But let's talk about why we think this is really important for us in public health uh, to now begin to think about how to collaborate with those in the school of medicine. Because you know, if we stay in the school of medicine and then those in, in public health stay in their own department, then all of the things that we know about cancer prevention in terms of avoidance, vaccination for primary prevention, screening and treatment. And now we're talking about cancer interception because we actually really know that we can get uh, the early genomic markers of cancer. And if we can figure out how to really um, integrate it across the continuum of care, then we would not really uh, wait until we have invasive and metastatic cancer to begin to develop uh, intervention. So I'm not gonna talk about supportive care at the end of life because that's also very important. And we have colleagues who have been doing that. But this was sort of 
in the invasive cancer was where I was for a very long period of time. Until now, I'm really thinking we're here now where we can really use precursor lesions uh, and even go even further back to begin to think about carcinogens and then avoid um, uh, uh, avoidance and uh, and then of course uh, tobacco prevention, HPV, hepatitis B, and treatment of H. pylori. These are all major interventions that have given us the opportunity to even further reduce uh, our cancer risk. And then of course, um, uh, anytime you have tobacco cessation, people uh, outcomes get better. Uh, and then you know, for me, the most important thing is how do we do uh, 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 risk reduction if we don't do risk assessment. So we have uh, gastroenterologists that have told us about the polyps, uh, the intraneoplasia, uh, 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 intraepithelial neoplasia that we can uh, uh, remove. And then, you know, once we started doing genetics, people started talking about prophylactic surgery. Uh, but I really think that prophylactic surgery maybe 10 years from now, we'll be saying why were we recommending that again? Because we can actually do better than that. So here's what I have done uh, with my career at the University of Chicago. We've done a lot of uh, 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 research, but Blacks uh, uh, in my uh, cancer center catchment area have the highest uh, uh, mortality rates. And so when you look at deaths at Cook County, 172 per thousand, and uh, Lake County, which is Northern Indiana, and they all come to us. But all of the counties that are surrounding our catchment area have the highest cancer mortality rate. And the common cancers that we think about, uh, breast, lung, prostate, colorectal, those, and think about prostate cancer in men, 2.36 um, uh, 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 mortality uh, ratio in Cook County. So we can't continue to, really talk about how great the University of Chicago is, if in fact, we're not making a dent in a catchment area. And then uh, Illinois has been good at looking at, okay, let's look at screening because screening is basically uh, what we have done for many years. And you can see in Illinois, uh, mammography after the age of 50, uh, we're not doing badly, Hispanic, black, in fact, we're doing more screening than white women, right? Compared to the US population, because of course uh, we expanded Medicaid and uh, cervical cancer screening. Uh, blacks in Chicago are not doing so badly. And then colorectal cancer, you can see uh, with a lot of re, uh, you know, uh, movements uh, across the state to actually uh, begin to uh, uh, collect data and work with uh, safety net hospitals. Um, uh, and of course, because of Medicaid expansion, we, we're doing better with screening. So then how come we still have the highest mortality rate for uh, white, uh, for black and brown women in Chicago? So the Chicago Breast Cancer Metropolitan Task Force has been really collecting data because we have so many academic centers. But this family, that I met, uh, it's black, you know, I named my, my uh, study participants. This was 1993, we started our clinic in 1992 and they came with a genealogy of 34 year old black woman, beautiful, vibrant. She had early stage uh, triple negative breast cancer because she felt a lump and knowing her family history, they all came, you know, in fact, not only did her sisters come, her cousin, her, her auntie, because they knew their family history. A family history is the cheapest genetic test. And this woman got treated on a, on a clinical trial. We gave her the best study that was available because you know she had access to the University of Chicago. And then uh, at that time, you know, having learned from Henry Lynch that you need to do family reunion. This is six generations of women this is a family that could trace their route to the South because they know that they were slaves in the South and then they came back, uh, they came up North. And by participating in research, we identified a pathogenic BRCA1 mutation. And then uh, Proband developed severe cardiomyopathy. 
she lost her insurance and with a low ejection fraction, no one, you know, I referred her by that time to my colleagues at Cook County Hospital because that's where I trained. So anyone that we can take care of at the University of Chicago, we made sure they went to the safety hospital. But then, you know, before we knew it, by age 40, she developed ovarian cancer and died within two years. Uh, of course, her treatment at that time uh, was probably suboptimal because she had no insurance. So let's circle back at what happened to this woman. So the benefit of the research of participating, bringing her family members in, and of course, then now the next generation of family members who are developing uh, cancer. And we are thinking, how do we keep this family uh, to benefit from the gains that we have had by studying BRC. Well, we published the paper with Mary Claire King, but what did, what, what did this woman benefit from all that research? And that's really where I, this idea that, uh, um, you know, the forced deportation of over 10 million Africans during the transatlantic slave trade has actually shaped, uh, you know, how we uh, see black patients uh, in, in America. And so this paper was published, of course, shortly after uh, the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter and the um, uh, uh, George Floyd's death. And, uh, and when you read the paper, you're gonna cry because many of these uh, 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 cousins and relatives of ours who went through the transatlantic slave trade, many of them did not make it. And also depending on where they made it, whether they were men or women, but some of the women who survived then settled in the South and the paper was saying there were more women who survived. And then the question is why didn't the men survive? And so you will see that there's been continuous violence on black and brown populations. And that's really what has shaped uh, the current genetic landscape of African ancestry in the Americas. So when I started talking about genetics, uh, my senior colleague, um, uh, uh, Professor Bowman would say, look, you know, I was a medical school student in Chicago. You can't even enter through the front door. Don't touch it. They're gonna use it to discriminate. And then I said, but you know, if we really are gonna talk about genetics, we have to go back to Africa. We have to know that we all came out of Africa. Some came out later because of uh, slave trade, but." all of us at some point came out of Africa. And as a result of that, when the human genome was completed, we're 99.9% 9 .9 identical. And then we can now use haplotypes based on the international half map and the uh, participation of a global community to know that, yeah, in Argentina, maybe there's not a lot of admixture, but they also do have a little bit of Congolese uh, haplotypes that you might find in uh, Argentina. Brazil doesn't even want you to talk about a race because they are all uh, so admixed that you know you you may have a, a dark skin uh, blonde uh, eyed um, uh, supermodel, uh, but in Bahia there's like an enclave there where people in in Bahia just you know some of them came back to West Africa, some of them stayed there and they remained you know true to their African culture. And you know, the first time my children went to Brazil and we got to Bahia, we were like, oh, definitely they are our cousins, right? So, but if you trace the proportion of admixture, there are some individuals that are only, have only less than 10% African ancestry and some that are almost 100%. So who is indigenous? Is it my, uh, the uh, uh, African-Americans that are in, in the South and have no uh, admixture? or uh, you know, studying West Africans. So we decided that we're gonna really do transcontinental studies and as much as possible go across the African uh, diaspora because my medical school was in Nigeria. And I know that we consider ourselves as West Africans because of the uh, economic block and because of the way that we were trained to collaborate. So we used to go and play cricket across West Africa and we, I, my, uh, uh, my Nigerian passport is a passport of the economic, um, uh, 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 of ECOWAS, which is the economic block for West African states. 
But I say this because when we say that black women have the highest death rate from breast cancer and we don't have enough numbers in all our studies, it's really because we have not taken the time to, uh, to study them. So I then said, I'm, that's all I'm gonna do. I'm gonna try to study breast cancer. And by the time we started studying breast cancer across the African diaspora, it became clear that if you do genomic studies, you will realize that breast cancer is not one disease and that the rising mortality really demands global solidarity and action. Just like with the pandemic, if we don't have solidarity and action, we're gonna to continue to have uh, inequities and we're all gonna be shut down in our own uh, homes and offices and we're not going anywhere. So the first postdoc that came to help me was Dijon who is now a professor of uh, epidemiology. And we just went, uh, we went to, uh, 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 to Barbados, we uh, looked at uh, collaborating with the North Carolina Breast Cancer Study, and then we went to Nigeria, Senegal, and then Ilori, just trying to see what is the uh, proportion of breast cancers in these countries that are either unclassified, basal-like, or too positive. And so there's been a lot of debate about genomic studies that we're now using. Do they actually tell us what we need to know? Why was it that when we tried to classify as our cancers, there were so many that were unclassified. And yet for Japanese, for white women in US and Poland, we could immediately classify them. The paper was published in 2009 and it took us longer than we, we should to publish it because everyone said our data was not correct. Well, the average of the, of the patient was 48 compared to average age of what we were looking at that published in the literature, which was in the sixth decade. So that's why we then really started talking about, look at the incidence and then look at mortality. Nigeria has one of the highest mortality, the Horn of Africa. So it's not so much about who is getting diagnosed with breast cancer, it's who is dying of breast cancer. Okay, so then, uh, you know, uh, Dijon being a card carrying epidemiologist decided, um, you know, we should just really go and do case control study. And we were fortunate to have been able to get some uh, funding from the Department of Defense and also from the NCI. And, um, and so uh, in phase one, uh, uh, for 20 years, we were able to recruit more than uh, 3,500 cases and nearly 3,000 controls from uh, Ibadan, Lagos, Yaoundé, and, uh, and then we uh, did some community and hospital controls in, in Nigeria. And, uh, and what we found uh, now that we can do testing and we know that uh, ER negative breast cancer and basal-like breast cancer was associated with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation, we did the experiment. We had money and um, we collaborated with uh, Mary Claire King's lab and, uh, and we wanted to know if we did a thousand cases and a thousand controls of these young women, how many of them will have mutations in high, BRCA1, BRCA2. And you can see if you add up, this is uh, uh, in all of the genes, it was about 15%. So one in eight of these women had an identifiable mutation. And compared to controls where we only had 1.1%, and of course, 0.3% uh, for BRCA1, 0.3% for BRCA2. So when you do the odds ratio, these are really high risk alleles. Then we said, is it generalizable? We did the same thing in Cameroon and Uganda. And you can see they don't have a lot of breast cancer, but the ones we were able to get the same high rates. And then we went to Bahia in Brazil. This was really a convenient sample of cases and then controls and majority of them um, um, you know, self-reported that they were black. We didn't do ancestry informative markers, but you can see very uh, high uh, frequencies of mutations, including a few founder mutations in Bahia. Then, uh, uh, of course, shortly after we published our paper in 2018, um, and then of course, the uh, um, uh, Julie Palmer, who is an amazing epidemiologist, uh, uh, Boston University published on the um, uh, Black Women's uh, Health Study. And you can see the average age in this 5,000 cases and 5,000 controls is 54, right? 
clearly a decade older than the women that we're describing here. And uh, even with this study, you can see when you add this up, um, uh, it was um, you know 3.5 percent plus four uh, percent. That's almost eight percent of these women had a mutation, right? That was identified compared to controls. So um, now, not to outdo uh, what we have done, the Carrier Study, which is from the Breast Cancer Association Consortium, they published in the New England Journal um, 32,000 cases and 32,000 controls. And when you interpret the data, they're going to say, well, but these mutations are rare because it's only 2% of patients who had the mutations. But look at the age. These are women who are diagnosed 15 years older than the Nigerians and uh, at least five years older than uh, the African-American cases. So there's where in America, we now have a challenge because people are saying, when should you start screening? Should we start screening at 50? Should we start screening at 40? Should we average it and then tell everybody to go and get screened at 45? It's not that simple, but we need to do more studies. So I was truly looking to see whether we could have a voice in the African-American uh, community that would talk about the types of breast cancers that we have and the fact that genetics actually may matter. Even though being black and white, we've had all sorts of things that we debate, but I think genetics is genetics. And so when Beyonce's dad, Matthew knows, shared you know, an emotional uh, story that he had male breast cancer and he was tested and he had BRCA2 mutation, I said, I've been looking for our own celebrity because I used to have Angelina Jolie on this picture because once the Supreme Court unanimously, and that's why, you know, no matter what you say about the Supreme Court now, they at least defended genetic justice and they overturned Myriad's pattern. And that allowed all of us to be able to do testing in our lab. That's why we could do the, the work with uh, Mary Claire King. And now we're talking about population risk stratification to reduce cost and improve breast cancer outcomes for all patients, not only the rich and uh, uh, who can afford it and have been having genetic testing for decades. Because what we have learned is that, uh, and this is you know, because we're in the Department of Epidemiology, this is odds ratio. If you have a protein truncating mutation, uh, in, in this high risk genes. And this paper has been published. I refer you to you in the New England Journal. So the Breast Cancer Association Consortium, right? They did uh, studies of 34 genes and whether it's ER positive breast cancer or ER negative breast cancer, the top genes are BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, right? Look at the odds ratio. Look at BRCA1 right up there. And, um, and so, whether you, uh, and then, you know, or we can do the whole genome now, but the thing is these top genes and P53 comes in there as well. They are the most significant genes. And they look at some of the other genes that actually confer ER negative breast cancer. So if we focus on these genes that cause ER negative breast cancer, might we be able to do better risk stratification for uh, individuals of African uh, uh, ancestry and all these genes, MSH6, this, this are genes that we know are highly penetrant and will cause breast cancer. And if you look at the odds ratio, it's high enough that we should be really thinking about how we disseminate this information in the communities. Because if we look at the risk of cancer, this is what happens. You're born with the genetics, and you do okay if the cancer is not starting at 20, but the risk for BRCA1 goes up beginning in your 20s, right? And then we previously said, well, by age 80, uh, you have 80, 85% chance of getting breast cancer, but that's no longer the case. This is using 113,000 women who were ascertained that yes, the risk is high, but there are modifiers of risk because not, everyone develops breast cancer. Not everyone even develops the breast cancer in their 30s or their 40s. It goes up 
And then BRCA2, of course, is very different from BRCA1. And people tend to just lump everything together. It's not. BRCA2 doesn't start going up until you are in your 40s and then PALB2. So even if we just take these three high-risk genes, we might be able to find individuals who should start screening early. And then of course we have uh, these additional genes uh, that we can add to, the, um, to our panel uh, compared to the average uh, uh, person in the general population. So the average person, you, you, know, you can wait till you are 50, you can wait till you are 60, because you're gonna get an indolent type of breast cancer. So that's really why we're talking about population risk stratification to begin to reduce small risk. So that's the high risk alleles. And then because I'm speaking to uh, those of you in uh, uh, epidemiology, so okay, how, what else is missing there? I said, okay, 15%, we have high risk alleles. What else is going on? We still have 200,000 women or more than that who develop breast cancer every year. Uh, 44,000 women die from metastatic disease. So why shouldn't we continue to screen and get everybody to screen? So what is the case? Uh, why is it that we're missing the uh, heritability? So people talk about uh, single, uh, um, single nucleotide variants, copy number variants. Now we're talking about structural variants that sometimes are even more common in African genomes. And then we're talking about epigenetic variation. And all of these variations are normal because that's the way uh, 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 genomics is uh, distributed. And then the question is, are we using the wrong models or the wrong population? So people are now beginning to think about, you know, if we are missing um, heritability and we've only looked at European ancestry group, um, might we really begin to think about other things? And so for those of you who are you know, uh, upset about the fact that we don't have the data and we haven't um, really done a lot of work, I would say do not despair because uh, you know, uh, this is one of my postdocs who came and everything that was published that we thought um, we could quickly replicate in our data set, all of it, uh, most of it, we have what we call flip-flop. So in one population, it's a risk allele in the other population, it's actually a protective allele. And we now know that there's actually a protective allele uh, yeah, that's really indigenous to uh, American, um, Native Americans that is protective against breast cancer that is common among Hispanics. And so how do we factor that in? And that's why we begin to say, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Even if you talk about Latinas, that you want to study them or Hispanics. And we'd say, okay, uh, you know, you have to ask, are they from Mexico? Are they from Peru? Are they Colombian? And so lumping and putting everybody in the one straight jacket doesn't work. And that's really what geneticists have been saying that we need genomic research in diverse uh, populations as a priority for global oncology, because this is the data we're working with. And if you look at the world's population, it's, it's, it just isn't really getting any better, right? We keep studying the same uh, 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 populations and expecting to have more discovery. So I hope that um, you know, we can contribute a little bit more. And so the, uh, we, we did a genome-wide association study of breast cancer uh, for women of uh, African ancestry. And uh, we called our own a consortium, the root consortium, because we wanted to get to the root of breast cancer and uh, Nigeria, Barbados, and uh, we pulled studies from uh, Philadelphia, Chicago, Baltimore, and then the Southern Community Cohort. So uh, doc, uh, Dr. Stefan Ams uh, collaborating with University of Maryland. But you can see even with all that, uh, we only could get, we, did, we got less than 2000 cases and two, and uh, 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 controls to do a GWAS study and then others are consortia coming together. So, um, but you know, it's, near, it's not nearly enough. And then, you know, uh, the confluence study and Ade Doku, uh, who is a postdoc that just um, um, uh, left my lab, uh, but he was able to really do uh, a great job finding additional loci 
and uh, just published his paper in uh, uh, Nature Communications. So finally getting 19,000 cases and 10,000 controls. So, you know, it's getting better. And you can see that the Root Consortium has the youngest case, uh, the Gra Ghana Breast Health Study, young, very young. And then of course, with the African-Americans. So this is a young cohort now with an average age of 52. And we have additional loci that he identified. These are novel that hadn't been seen in other populations. And we were quite uh, excited that we're actually doing better with ER negative breast cancer. But the question is, if you have ER negative breast cancer, what are you gonna do about it? Is there, do we have drugs? Uh, and now we're putting polygenic risk models together and everybody's concerned that, you know, a polygenic risk, you can see how it calibrates in terms of low risk allele. Is it possible to actually find people who are at low risk and don't need to get screened and then find people at the highest risk? Because for a very long time, until we started really going to do more mammography, we always said black women have a low risk for breast cancer, but now they have, uh, you know, their rates have become the same as white women and everybody said, oh, we're doing better. But it's because we were finding DCIS and indolent cancers that will not kill you, right? So, but we don't know who actually has the highest risk for aggressive ER negative breast cancer. And that's why we need to begin to think about how do we refine polygenic risk scores? So there's some um, Caucasian uh, uh, and uh, 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 white uh, uh, women with uh, 313 variants that have been uh, uh, published, and then Hispanic, East and Southeast Asians, and African ancestry groups. And we know that um, you know those polygenic risk scores are not perfect, but uh, but when you try to work with them, just don't forget that he's African. And uh, this is the root. That is why we talk about going to look at the uh, uh, genetic diversity across the African diaspora. And then we had the bottleneck and now a fraction became uh, European ancestry. And then of course, a further fraction uh, in East um, uh, Asia. Uh, and, uh, and so that's really how geneticists are beginning to think about what do we have? What are the um, uh, minor allele frequencies and how do we actually develop polygenic risk score that may work for everybody? Because in fact, the root is the same. And then the question is, we know that there's gene environment interactions and our people have gone to different environments. They have had a different uh, evolutionary trajectory of their cancers. So this is really just talking about when you take a risk a little frequency in different populations of European ancestry, and then you try to correlate it with individuals of African ancestry, uh, you have to really see which one is working and it's really right on, on, the, on the line or which ones are just really outliers. So just calibrating the 179 SNPs and the 313 SNPs, and you'll find that a majority of the SNPs actually are not, um, uh, good enough to be used, but some of them will give you uh, some uh, good uh, odds ratio. And that's really why uh, we were able to now test this uh, and uh, pick up uh, uh, individual SNPs that could be used in African-American data set. And even after we do that, uh, what we're able to find is that yes, overall PRS, uh, in our data set um, um, for ER positive and ER negative, it's getting better. But if you look at the area under the curve, uh, it's better than 0.51 that we started with, but it's still not good enough. And, and this has been published. Uh, can it be improved? Well, I think it can be improved. And uh, if you see the separation, what we're trying to do is, can we separate the, uh, the top, 99% uh, risk uh, from the bottom uh, low, low risk. And then how do we do a cutoff point to be able to identify those individuals whose risk of breast cancer is gonna begin by age 40 or whether it's eight, by age 35 or by age 30. And when you spread this out a little bit, you would see that in fact, we can identify using PRS, 
the people in the highest uh, percentile who will have the highest risk. And then we can decide when we want to do the, uh, we want them to know, but a genetic uh, uh, polygenic risk you were born with. And then the question is, at what point do we do the intervention? And this is getting better because we're actually really starting by developing the models using populations of African ancestry. So let me wrap up by saying, uh, I wrote this very rather naive uh, editorial in the uh, uh, New England Journal of Medicine in uh, 1996, as soon as we understood the, the BRCA1 knockout mice develop cancer. And I was saying, you know, this is really important information. At the same time, uh, colleagues um, found that women who had BRCA1 mutation and ovarian cancer actually did really well compared to controls. So if you have a population that has more BRCA1 and more BRCA2, they should do better than populations that don't have the mutation. But the problem is they don't even know they were born with that mutation because nobody is testing them. Nobody is paying attention. So hence we have women who wake up and then suddenly the cancer has metastasized. And then we said, oh, black women have the most aggressive type of breast cancer. And so this is the paradigm that got me thinking that in 1996, why aren't we testing everybody and just get everybody with BRCA1 and put them on a clinical trial and develop drugs for them? And guess what? We have drugs that work. The drugs work even better. And now we have five or more PAP inhibitors. We have immunotherapy. They work. But when you read the literature, everybody in pharma would say, oh, well, there's very little uh, poor enrollment of black patients in studies. And you know, why would they go? Because you have not met their clinical need, right? We've lumped everybody together. And, uh, and you know, breast cancer is a heterogeneous disease. And it's really a prototype of cancer health disparity. If you have treatments that work, some people will do well and others will not do well. And so what is the trajectory of breast cancer in women of African ancestry? Is it that they denied? And so when we go to the community and we ask, and my, my friend from Nigeria, who was in, in primary school with me today, her sister is getting bilateral mastectomy in Nigeria today. And she said, I have never seen anyone survive breast cancer. And when we went to the community in Chicago here, and we would say it's a myth, but the people who have never seen anyone survive cancer, they, you, they will say, if you let air in, then it's going to metastasize. Of course, if you let air in by doing surgery, it is already too late. So we then you know, looked at, even in, our, at, in patients who make it to the University of Chicago, we've now uh, looked at the uh, odds ratio. Uh, and this is published in Breast Cancer Research and Treatment. If you have homoreceptor positive or two negative breast cancer, you're supposed to do well. If you have homoreceptor negative or two positive breast cancer, you're supposed to uh, have you know, a lower risk of recurrence. But for, in fact, for the triple positive and triple negative, that's where you have the least disparity because we, we still don't have good treatments for this. But this, this cancer is where we have effective therapies. Look at the uh, disparities. So that's really getting more granular data for us from a single institution. And then if you look at uh, women who come in, because now uh, in oncology, I wrote a paper and I said, everybody should get new adjuvant therapy. This was in 2008, because when I see black women coming to my clinic, we treat locally advanced breast cancer with new adjuvant therapy. And some of these women have triple negative breast cancer, the tumor melts away, but oh, we have to get the evidence. We have to do randomized clinical trial. We cannot use single institution observation. So that paper was not, that uh, my, my personal experience was not published, but look at this. If you get PCR, 70 uh, a homo receptor negative or two positive, and look at our black patients, they're getting only 42%. And, uh, and, uh, and then the question is, uh, why is that the case? Uh, why is that important? If you have uh, 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 a past CR, there's actually hardly any difference between black and white, right? Because path CR is really important for recurrence-free survival. 
where you start having a problem is if you don't have a part CR, and then you can see the drop off for black women, right? Without uh, the recurrence free survival. And of course, if you recall from triple negative breast cancer or HO2 positive breast cancer, when uh, there's no, uh, there are no other drugs, then of course you have poor outcomes. So this is in about 705 patients, 51% white, 39% black with a long follow-up because I've been practicing now for 30 years at the University of Chicago. And these are patients in my database and of course my colleagues database. And what did we have, find? Well, whites had five, five weeks versus um, 6.2 weeks to get into treatment. It, that may matter or it may not matter, right? You have longer delay of chemotherapy. This is the longer delay of chemotherapy is what I'm concerned about because as you remember, my patient had adromycin and developed cardiomyopathy because she developed a, a toxicity to the drug we were giving her. She ended up dying because she couldn't get surgery that could have prevented her from, from uh, uh, not getting uh, uh, ovarian cancer. So no significant differences in treatment regimens received, but one size doesn't fit all. Even when you think about toxicity to, uh, to therapies, but we're quick to blame black patients for their own disparity. So the, 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 the story is evolving. And we actually looked at mutational landscapes of 13 pairs of primary and residual breast tumors. What's going on when you don't have a part CR? We looked at tumor mutation burden and seven had reduced, five increased and one the same. Of six or two positive breast cancer, one residual cancer did not have uh, or two amplification, right? When you compare tumor and, and, and uh, before and after. And so, you know, if you then say everybody who doesn't have a uh, part CR, just go and get this uh, regimen, you may not really be doing the best thing for your patients. So we are really all about trying to get a better understanding of mutational signatures and evolutionary tra trajectory by doing whole genome studies. And this paper has also been, uh, been published in uh, Nature Communications. And, uh, and what we really want to talk about is that now that we have better tools to actually do genomic analysis, here's a Nigerian cohort, here's the black in America, here's white in TCGA. And of course, you know, TCGA has very few whole genomes from white women and black women, but in Nigeria, we published on a hundred whole genomes, looking at single base substitutions, the HRD signature, the double base substitution, which showed higher activity in Nigerian tumors. And then in Dell, which we, where we found a novel signature, which showed a, a clear positive climb from white to black to Nigerian, both in prevalence and activity. And the only way we could see this is when we had more Nigerians, more blacks compared to 46, right? So the question that we ask ourselves is, do we get signals lost because we don't um, uh, study the original uh, population? And uh, we, we started looking at homo homologous recombination def deficiency in breast cancer tumors and uh, showed that what we've all been using uh, which is the uh, SBS3 signature, is a poor classifier of HRD. By the time you use copy number, structural variants, and then try to use code, which is the new uh, algorithm that we're using, then you will have better classification. And then you can see the Nigerians, how they are classifying the blacks, and then uh, whites in TCGA. And then here, you can see BRCA1 type HRD, um, uh, then um, uh, uh, BRCA2 HRD, and then uh, unspecified. And the, the story is here. If you look at the Nigerian, we were able to find all BRCA1 and BRCA2 HRD using this algorithm. Blacks, we missed one. And then, uh, and then in, in whites in TCGA, we had uh, one that could not be classified. So that's really consistent with our uh, um, 
somatic uh, 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 with a germline sequencing that we already have. So 34% of these tumors with, with HRD will benefit from a PAP inhibitor or just from cisplatinum, which we already knew works for ovarian cancer. So let me end by saying we now have a case for population risk stratification. Here's what we got with just getting everybody to get their mammogram. And here's where metastatic breast cancer has been. Uh, here's what we are getting now with early stage breast cancer in young, uh, women younger than 40 years old, right? Hardly any move in uh, the late stage of diagnosis, right? So why is this happening? Well, I think uh, we don't know, but I think uh, I'm part of a wisdom study where we're really trying to see whether we can recruit 70,000 women to agree to uh, choose risk-based adaptive screening, whether they would choose if they want to continue annual screening or you want to do risk-based and we can just follow them over a period of time. And the risk-based will include testing and you can get your breast cancer risk for. This is already in, 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 uh, available for white women where you can get a test from one of the genetic laboratories. I think in this case, it's Myriad. and will tell you your risk uh, 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 over a lifetime. And uh, what we wanna do is to actually really uh, go after the fact that BRCA1 mutation occurs in young women before the age of 40. If you are gonna get breast cancer before the age of 40, you need to use MRI. And here's a little cancer that we found and we've published it. And Christina Cole uh, did uh, an editorial and said more is more. Uh, uh, breast MRI screening in BRCA1 mutation carriers because they develop lethal aggressive breast cancer early. And we're hoping to make this into a national study and build a model that will use ultra fast MRI, make it cheaper, faster, and more accurate than conventional MRI. And the reason because we need to not find every cancer, we just need to find the aggressive cancer and so my team, they go to Black Women's Expo, they're going to, and by the way, the Sky uh, won um, uh, the Women's World Championship this year. So I, we're really excited on the South side of Chicago uh, because I think, you know, we need to really disseminate this information and make sure it's, it's picked up in the community. I'm, I was also very thrilled that the NCI is thinking about this trans NCI liquid biopsy multi-cancer early detection program, because we need to really go uh, back and forth from the community to you know, the science. The reason why we were able to do the MRI screening is because women in, on the South side of Chicago will not accept bilateral mastectomy. They're like, it's, when it's not broken, why are you asking me to take off both breasts? Let's do screening. And now we're going back and forth to see whether we can even uh, begin to find those early uh, copy number changes in liquid biopsy. So let me end by saying, how do we get to health equity? World Health Organization, you know, UN right to health was in 1948. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease of infirmity. So, you know, we need to begin to adopt public moral norms where we can all be outraged at health disparities. We need to advocate for right to health. And then, you know, what are our responsibilities to each other? So that's really why we need to have a just allocation of responsibilities. If you're a cancer center and your catchment area has people who are disproportionately affected by cancer, you need to figure out what to do. So let me end by saying that um, we're really uh, doing better uh, uh, in terms of our treatments but it's not getting to everybody. Uh, we can now begin to improve and build polygenic risk variants to help with better risk prediction. And then, you know, if we all collaborate and we look at the early lesions integrated, right? We're all descendants of one human race from Africa. And we just need to really pay attention to what's driving our analysis. So I wanna end by thanking my Nigerian breast cancer team. They're smart, they're energetic. They wanna be part of a global community. Anytime you do a study or you do uh, 
a, a, a workshop there, there to be part of it. And then of course, a team uh, from Cameroon, Uganda, and then uh, Areta investigators. So um, my lab is full. This was our last retreat before uh, the pandemic. It's, this is Adedoku and a lot of people, young people who want to make a difference were diverse. So thank you. And uh, of course we couldn't have done this without our patients and their families.